All right, Texas somehow, some way, finds a way to win it in overtime, 33-30 to over Kansas State. They stopped the Wildcats on fourth and goal in the first overtime to win it. Tommy Yarsh here alongside the flyest man in Austin, Texas, Eric Henry, joining us from DKR Memorial Stadium. Eric, let's go back to this game. Fourth down play in the second quarter. Texas has a chance to kick a field goal and go up 20 to nothing. Instead, they go for it. They're stopped, and te- they're stopped short of the Kansas State 19. Is this issue with fourth down and the red zone now finally getting to a point where Steve Sarkeesian in games like this and going forward is just going to have to take the points? Oh, oh boy, Tommy, coming in strong here to open up our post game reaction. So to let the viewers know who may not have been here at DKR Texas Memorial Stadium, I mean there definitely were some feelings around the decision to go for it. On fourth down, excuse me. I mean, as we were heading down to, sorry about that, battling the cough here. As we were going down to post game, Tommy, I'll bring you in here. We had fans who were asking us, like, hey, ask Steve Sarkeesian about the decision to go for it on fourth down. I mean, it was clearly on people's minds as that ball game finished. You talk about it, it's a 33 30 victory, and the the decision to uh, not take the points and go for a touchdown. And I'll get into Steve Sarkeesian's logic in a second, Tommy, but those are swings. You know, that's a three-point swing one way that almost led to a BYU uh, swing the other way. They ended up getting a touchdown, and then some uh, some issues at the end of the half gave them another opportunity where they, uh, you know, right before halftime could have ended up with three points. And, of course, you know, they kind of had their own clock, man- clock management issues of their own, excuse me. But those things, you know, in the 33-30 ball game make the difference. So, in specificity to your question, when I asked Steve Sarkeesian about it, he said, hey, look, you know, I'm going to continue to be aggressive on fourth down. And he led with if, uh, you know, if I somehow, you know, decide to, you know, be conservative or not, you know, go from fourth down, we don't get the C.J. backs their long touchdown run. And that is fair, right? You know, with Sark's aggression, that it's going to come good and he's going to come bad. And I, I don't have my his direct quote in front of me, but the gist of it was, you know, is, hey, I don't, I, I can't sit here and think about what if or what could have, should have happened. You know, I got to make the decision. And he, he kind of ended his his quote, Tommy, with a quip. He said, hey, for those of you guys who may have been wondering what the book may have said, the books that go for it as well. So uh, that was his decision making there and, and his reasoning. And again, like I said, I, it's not something that I, it's not something that I don't like, but I think it, to your point, which you kind of emphasize in the question, if you're going to be that aggressive on third down and fourth on fourth down, and, and especially in the red zone on goal line, you need a higher execution, right? Because those things that I think you kind of can't account for are momentum swings. We talked about this earlier in the year as far as teams getting key fourth downs. I talked about in the Oklahoma game, Red River shootout, right? You know, them getting four tries from the Oklahoma two yard line and not being able to capitalize. That's a huge momentum swing. And, and you kind of saw that here today, Tommy, in terms of. When, you know, the Wildcat play didn't work and we asked again, C. Sarkeesian said that, you know, the ball kind of rubbed off of the hip of C.J. Baxter, but otherwise it was going to be a touchdown to J.T. Sanders. I asked J.T. postgame. He said, yeah, no doubt. I knew that that play was going to work. It just didn't, we didn't execute it properly. But based on the looks that we saw and, and how much we executed in practice, we knew that play was going to work. So they all are standing behind that decision to go for a fourth down. But as you said, if you're going to, you know, make those decisions, at some point in time, if you're not executing at a high clip, those are just big momentum swings for the other team. And, you know, it, it kind of, in, in, in essence, Tommy, you know, led to the Kansas State being in this ball game. And it looked like, quite frankly, 20-0. I even said to some of the guys on press row, I think we might get Kansas is really, let's get Kansas, Texas is really statement victory for them to, you know, to make a, a case of the CFB committee, right? But clearly, you know, Kansas State had other, Plans ended up being a much tighter ball game, but all in all, Steve Sarkeesian defended his decision to go for it on fourth down, and I understand the reasoning, but I just think you kind of have to take into account, you know, hey, if for whatever reason we're not executing at a high clip, you know, and, and I'd say in the 60% and 70%, you, you could end up with some momentum swings that put teams in position to come back in ball games. Well, Texas certainly made a statement to the CFP committee. Not sure if it's the one that they wanted or what they could have had had they gone up 20 to nothing earlier in the game. But, you know, Eric, coming into this week, we knew that this, the trenches were going to be very important for Texas, really on both sides of the ball. And I think it's safe to say that they won that area of the game today, especially defensively. The big guys up front have been phenomenal all season for Texas, Devondre Sweat, Byron Murphy. 
specifically down the line. Devondre Sweat gets that swat on second and goal for Kansas State on the goal line, and then he gets pressure again. He and Baron Sorrell have got pressure on the fourth and goal that ended up winning Texas the game. Offensively, they get 230 yards on the ground, did not give up a sack on Malik Murphy all day today. Eric, do you think that it's safe to say that the trenches won this game for Texas? Safe to say is an understatement. There's no doubt that play on both sides – of the ball in the trenches at the line of scrimmage won this game for Texas. You know, first off, we start on the offensive side of the ball. We have almost 200 yard rushers. I'm taking a look at the stat sheet right here. We got Jonathan Brooks, you know, 22 carries for 112 yards. CJ Baxter, 10 for 90. There's no doubt that the play up front, and you talk about the fact that Malik Murphy was not sacked. Those things made a, 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 a you know a huge difference on offense. And you flip to the defensive side of the ball, talk about those late stands you know the one in the fourth quarter where will howard you know they have an opportunity third and one just pick up one yard we're talking about a kansas team that's the sixth ranked rushing team in the nation two tries to get one yard they can't do it they end up losing a yard on third down and then getting stuffed on fourth down fast forward to overtime same thing so there's no doubt about it when you take a look at what kind of allowed kansas state to get back in this ball game it was not the trenches. You know, I, I think it was interesting, Tommy, in my mind. You take a look at the first half, and I don't want to, you know, necessarily downplay the, the, the effort of the Wildcats. But it looked almost as if their entire strategy was to do everything that Texas does well on defense, running into the teeth of, you know, Texas's defensive line and trying to go wide against guys like Jalen Ford and Mo Blackwell and others who clearly have enough speed to go make those plays and, and chase those plays down. But I don't know if it was a – an adjustment or if it was a, a matter of, hey, we're down two scores and we have to throw the football a little bit, but they found success in the past game. I think that was the big thing that that along with the turnovers and some of the lack of execution, some of the things I mentioned in that first question, those were the things that really allowed Kansas State to get back into this ball game. But uh, what won it for Texas undoubtedly was to play in the trenches. All right, we'll talk about the offense a little bit more. Now, second start for Malik Murphy, and he had his struggles today, but when his passes were on target, Adonai Mitchell was phenomenal for him. Uh, he finished this game eight receptions for 149 yards and a touchdown. When Mitchell transferred over from Georgia, the big thing for Texas was this is a guy who, when Xavier Worthy gets a lot of attention, they can scheme open and get him the ball. And so far, that has happened, especially in the last two games. He's been big for Malik Murphy and his first two starts. You know, that's been the case as of late. Is this a trend that you think continues even when and if Quinn Ewers comes back? And, you know, how 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 much can this offense do with Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, even though Worthy hasn't been involved the past couple of weeks as much? Whether it continues or not, Tommy, that's a little bit questionable, right? I only say that because there's so many weapons on this Texas offense. Some days it's going to be Jonathan Brooks' day. Some days it's going to be C.J. Baxter's day. Some days, you know, it'll be J.T. Sanders or Jordan Whittington, right? But I definitely think in my mind what you can depend on is the fact that teams will have to shift their coverages one way or the other, right? And some teams are going to decide we're going to take Xavier Worthy out of the game. Some teams are going to say, hey, you know, maybe we want them to try to throw the ball to Xavier Worthy, you know, 10, 12 times, and let's try to counter with some of the other guys. And maybe it's, hey, we're going to try Keen on the run, right? So I don't necessarily know if it continues. But if you take a look at the stat sheet, right, you know, Xavier Worthy today had four grabs. It took 14 passes to get him the football. There's definitely a lack of efficiency, and I think some of that comes with maybe not having the the reps that X and Quinn Ewers have together. There's a lack of efficiency with Xavier Worthy and Malik Murphy. But with that being said, that's why you have a guy like A.D. Mitchell. And that's not taking anything away from Jordan Whittington, who is more, uh, certainly more than capable receiver in his own right. It's going to be an NFL player, as Steve Sarkeesian said uh, many times. You know, hey, Jay Witt's going to be a guy who plays in the NFL for a long time because he's that talented of a player. But it, it just goes to show the depth of this team in my mind. And that is another thing that's making the difference. They've repeatedly talked about culture making the difference. I think culture certainly, you know, helps, but having the talent when maybe it's not X's day, right? And, you know, you, that that redshirt freshman quarterback who's making his second start isn't the, having the type of connection with your star receiver. Well, then you have a guy like AD who he is having a connection with, right? So I think that def really helps Texas in the long term. And the fact of the matter is this, Tommy, you know, Adnai Mitchell is a guy who, if you, went through 65, 70% of FBS football teams, 
would be a number one target. He would be a wide receiver one, right? So for Texas to have that capability, to have a guy like that who can stretch the defense, can make plays across the middle of the defense, and also, you know, be someone who, again, defensive coordinators have to account for in, in all levels, you know, at, at, the, at the, the short, intermediate, and long game, you know, all levels of the defense. I just think this is another weapon that Texas has going forward. So whether or not it continues, we'll see. I think some of that's going to depend on, you know, Quinn Ewer's health and, whether we see him next week, but I, I definitely think A.G. Mitchell is someone who, as this season plays on, whether it's, you know, going to the Big 12 title game or maybe even further than that, you're going to have to account for him because he's easily capable of 100-yard days. Our own Hank South calls him Adonai the Touchdown Guy, which is a very fun nickname, by the way. He gets one more today. Last point here before we get to our offensive and defensive MVPs today for Texas, Eric. Uh, Malik Murphy, absolutely struggled from the second quarter on looked good in the first two drives but after that really just kind of looked off a little bit uh, he took a couple big hits he missed practice earlier in the week statistically started off 11 of 15 for 175 yards and a touchdown in this game after that he goes just 8 of 22 for 73 yards and two picks so Steve Sarkeesian said in his post-game press that he was still confident enough in Malik Murphy to have him come out and finish that game but Eric if Quinn Ewers doesn't come back healthy enough to go next week in Fort Worth, how much of a leash do you think Malik Murphy is going to have until an uncomfortable conversation is going to have to be had? It's a good question. Here's the best answer I can give you, Tommy. You know, you talked about what Steve Sarkisian said post game, him having confidence in Malik Murphy. The line that stood out to me is he said he would not put a player out there who he didn't believe could get the job done. Right. And he said, you know, Malik's a talented guy. The big thing with him is he doesn't necessarily have the reps and understand that, hey, sometimes a check down is a good play or throwing the ball away is a good play or a punt is a good play. Right. So I think in that sense, it, it, it kind of beard out today and it beard out today, beard out um, on the field last week as well in terms of sometimes Malik trying to force things. Right. So I do think, as Steve Sarkeesian said, that's on them as coaches to kind of emphasize that and coach those things out of him, that there's still room for Malik to grow as, as, a, as a player, as a quarterback, and I think in his decision-making as well. Now, directly to your question as far as how much of a leash does he have, that's a tough, tough ask in my mind to ask a true freshman in Arch Manning to come in and, you know, quote-unquote, save the day, right? Because inevitably, Tommy, I mean, if – if in my mind you're pulling Malik Murphy, it's a situation in which you're down or you know the offense is struggling and and, and you kind of need a spark, right? You're not gonna pull Malik Murphy if the game is seven seven, you know, unless it's just abysmal and he's throwing four interceptions, you know, you, you're not gonna pull him, right? As Sark has emphasized in his quotes, he's gonna give him enough leash, enough room to kind of fill those things out. So in, in my mind, I, I just the gut feeling I have with it is if there were gonna be a switch, it, it's going to be something that you see from the week and not necessarily something that you see in game unless, as I said, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we take this post game, when we knew that Malik Murphy would be starting, you know, unless he completely, you know, just kind of bombed out there and had a game that, you know, with multiple turnovers. But you can even look at one of the interceptions today. John T. Cook, you know, got his feet tangled up, right, and, and looked like it be a little bit of a push as well. That's what resulted in one of the interceptions. So certainly some throws that Malik would like to have back, but I do think that's why, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, quarterback coach A.J. Milby, offense corner Kyle Flood, the, the whole staff, the whole crew, they're going to have to coach those things out of him as opposed to just, you know, yanking the guy and, and, and trying to, you know, see what happens with the true freshman quarterback. And the other thing in that situation, too, you'd essentially be throwing a true freshman quarterback who's never played a snap of college football into a hostile road environment. And like you said, Eric, if Arch Manning is going to have to come in, that's likely going to mean they either aren't getting anything going offensively or they're down or both. So an interesting thing to look at there. We'll keep an eye on Quinn Ewers' health throughout the week. Now, players of the game, offense and defense, you take it away first. Offensive player of the game, you got to go A.D. Mitchell, right? Again, the eight grabs for 100 and what was eight for 149. I may have shortened some yards earlier, but eight for 149 and a touchdown again. As I said, the, the capability, I'll use a, a word that Steve Sarkeesian uses, you know, the versatility of the offense to be able for, you know, one day it's one guy's game, one, one game it's another guy's day, right? So just having that versatility, I think, really helps. And again, you know, A.D. Mitchell, I don't think 
it, it, it kind of goes understated because Xavier Worthy is such a game breaker. And every time he touches the ball, whether it's on punt return or reverses, you know, he's such a, a threat to take it to the house. But A.T. Mitchell, again, is a really, really good and a, a really good explosive, a really explosive receiver in his own right. So, uh, you know, A.D. certainly, you know, made a big difference today. And again, I think the, the, the pass game looked a lot different just based on you go back to last week, Tommy, it took 10 targets for Xavier Worthy to have four receptions. And this week, what, it took 14 from to have five, right? So clearly that chemistry isn't quite there yet with Xavier Worthy, but he's got it with A.D. Mitchell, three touchdowns in two games. All right, I'll go quick here. Offensively, I'm going to go Jonathan Brooks, 22 carries for 112 yards and a touchdown. And then on the defensive side, the guy who I really think won Texas this game, and that's Tavondre Sweat in the middle of that defensive line. Four tackles, a tackle for loss, two pass breakups, and two quarterback hurries. So the big fellow in the middle gets the honors for me defensively. That's going to do it for us here on the Horns 24-7 Instant Reaction. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel. Make sure you like this video, subscribe, and turn on post notifications so you're the first to know when new content heads your way. For Eric Henry and the rest of the crew, I'm Tommy Yarsh. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.